I'm really excited to be here with a very special Jaguar. It's the XJR9, and this car is the Daytona 24 winner. And what makes it even more special to be here today is that it's the 25th anniversary of the win of that uh, Jag. And we've got a very, very special guest as well. It's just a, it's an amazing day, really. With me here today is Martin Brundle that drove one of these cars in period at Daytona. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. It's a great to see it again. Isn't it beautiful? A work of art. But I've got a little tear in my eye, to be honest, to, to see it again and realize how privileged I was to be part of such a great team and to race for Jaguar around the world and to have a go in this. J jump in, see what you think of it. Jump in? Yeah. This, is, this, is a, this will be a, f a first for me. Yeah, legs right. straight, legs slide straight. underneath. Like you're getting in the bath, basically. Like getting in the bath. Yeah. Just like this morning then. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You used to have about 12 seconds to get out and get the other driver 12 in. 12 seconds? So, yeah. It's an analog car, isn't it? It's switches and dials and a manual gear shift. I, I have to say, sitting in here, you feel actually, yeah, it's actually quite comfortable and you feel quite quite at home. You're sort of snug inside and, and I'm quite happy to be, uh, to be sitting inside. It's, it almost looks more daunting from the outside. Now imagine doing 200 miles an hour at night through the traffic and bumps of Daytona and it looks slightly more interesting. Flat out with that big V12 behind you and oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. But, it, but it's, it, it's just beautiful, isn't it? You've got old fashioned dials to tell you what's going on and chunky switches because remember it's night, it could be in the rain, you've got fireproof gloves on, so you need to know you've really switched the right switches and pumps on and fire it up and go. Hmm. And there'd be a little uh, warning light coming on to tell you to shift gear. It was really cosy, actually. I, I loved racing these cars at night because it was you and your beautiful car versus the track and the elements and the competition. Did you, did you almost prefer driving it at night than you did, uh, did during the day? I think I did, yes. It must have been much more of a challenge, though, at, at, at night. It was because you couldn't always see oil or debris or gravel right. on the racetrack, so it was right. a little bit scary in that respect. But it was sometimes you could um, smell the campfire from the middle of Daytona really? or at Le Mans. Uh, people cooking sausages and the smoke, uh, especially got a little bit foggy early in the morning as well. And all of these, all of your sensors were in hyper mode, uh -huh. and the V12 wailing way behind you. And you travelled a huge distance in 24 hours at uh, at such a speed. This guy was my nemesis actually. I raced against it at Daytona in 1990, and we were nip and tuck towards the end, and they they beat us when we had an, a water pressure issue and it was a great fight. On top of Jaguar winning Daytona uh, 24 in 1990, it was actually a 1-2 finish. Yeah. That's pretty impressive for, uh, for Jaguar for, uh, for going there and beating everyone else, but really beating everyone else by putting their two cars first and second. At Daytona, one of the toughest races in the world, I think it's the toughest race I've ever done personally, we smashed the competition in these cars. Unfortunately, when you get out, you don't have the help of gravity like you do when you're sliding into it. So yeah. <laughs> so how do, how, do, how do I get out? I, I need a quick lesson because I might be here for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> Slide out across the ledge and find something to shove your left foot against, really. Preferably not the fire extinguisher. <laughs> and there is a strap down there. That's it. Oh, that's not so bad. You must have been pretty, I guess, is it happy or, or proud to be the one to get into this carbon fiber tub. I mean, all the other cars, this was very advanced for the time, wasn't it? Not very many other cars, or this was the only car that had the, uh, the carbon fiber tub. Uh, I lost a teammate in sports car racing, um, driving a car that wasn't carbon fiber. So I insisted on driving something like the Jaguar that did have mm -hmm. a good chassis on it. You knew it would, take, safe. It would take a whack. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And you could stick this car in the barriers and almost certainly the chassis would be completely intact. It must have great sort of rigidity and as well as, uh, as, as safety. I think that's how we harness that m magnificent engine, to be honest, is that, yeah, the, the torsional stiffness of the car mm -hmm. was, was very good. You know, you had a lot of meat behind you, a lot of weight, so you had to... Uh, I you... think it's absolutely fantastic. There's a, there's, there is under here, there is a massive V12 engine. When you started these cars up, people jumped if they weren't looking as soon as it fired up. It got such a bark on it. Yeah, there was no doubt this thing was ready to go. As a racing driver, the stopwatch dominates your life. So yep. you don't really care too much about the niceties. You just want to go as fast as possible and win as many races as possible. So. And I suppose this car was the one for the job, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think the, 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 the 
lines of the car, looking at it from the outside. From the inside, it's great, but from the outside, it's just, it's just a sculpture. I mean, it's, it's a work of art. To me, I look at this car, and it, it looks like it's moving, yet it's standing still. It does, it's just it's fast, just standing still. It's just amazing. Inside is practical, purposeful. It's a racing car. Outside, it looks slippery, it looks fast, and it looks elegant. And it's a very analog car because you're part of it. You're strapped to the same piece of carbon fiber as that rather large V12 engine behind you. And you you'd start it up, you put the clutch in, stick it into first gear or second or third if you want, because it had so much torque. You could just drive off like so, a road car. So, I mean, I don't, you know, never since, was it actually quite easy to drive then? It's easy to make it move and to make it function, yes. Yeah. To yeah. make it break the lap record or win a of race course. was a different story because that is a fearsome engine. You know, it stands about this high. Uh -huh. So you could feel sometimes it was coming over your shoulder if you got a little bit deep into that, the corner. That would be exciting. <laughs> but we sorted it out with the handling. And then if you look at the back of the car, underneath, there's a, a Venturi at either side of the gearbox. I mean, look at that. If that was real estate in London, that would cost you a lot of money, <laughs> wouldn't it? There's so much downforce from the back of this car. And it started that Venturi just from behind your seat. And anybody following this car on a dirty part of the track would just be getting facefuls of rubbish as this thing literally hoovered up the track and generated the grip. The quicker you go, the track gets narrower and narrower. What speeds would you get up to? In the Mulzan, in Le Mans, before the chicanes, you were knocking on the door 400 kilometers per hour, 240 miles an so hour. So 400 kilometers an hour, day and night? Yeah, wet or dry. Wet or dry? Yeah. A Daytona, I mean, a Daytona a little bit less because you don't have the long straights and you needed the downforce for the infield and it's quite bumpy in places. So this car took a real pounding in Daytona, uh, yet it handled it beautifully. The biggest job was getting down the gears fast enough. Right, right, because the braking was so good and you'd yeah. approach the corner yeah. so quickly. Blipping the throttle, remember this is an analog car, so you're blipping the throttle, looking after the dog rings and the gear cluster as well because it's going to have to take you 3,000 miles in a 24 hour period. It was, it was, they were super reliable, weren't they? I mean, to do a 24-hour race is, puts a lot of stress on the car, on all the mechanical components, on the drivers, on everyone. I, I would imagine that when you're, you know, when you're in race mode and you're, you're driving, and as you say, you're sort of, you know, on the brakes hard, going into the corner, blipping the throttle, going through the gear, it must be very satisfying when you get it all right and it, the gears go through and as, as opposed to a flappy paddle that you just blip and it does it all for you. There must be some kind of satisfaction in, in you know, when you're on it and you get it all, it all comes together. Absolutely, because when you're driving it, you're strapped in with five belts to the same piece of carbon fiber that the engine and gearbox is bolted to. And of course, you're directly connected with a, a rod and a gear lever. You become like part of the car. You're, you're, you are together. That's absolutely right. It's, it's a fearsome engine, lots of power and torque, quite a lot of weight, huge amount of downforce. But you're the glue sitting in the middle. It makes the car come alive hearing your thoughts on what it was like because you, you were there and I, I just can't thank you enough for uh, coming down to, uh, to talk to us about it. It just adds so much to the car. So really thank you again for, for coming. It's been great having you here. Thanks, Martin. Lovely to see her again. <laughs>